Hello once again BC Calculus students. In this particular video we're going to be talking about the power series and primarily the convergence of these types of series. Uh, in the box here uh, as outlined in Theorem 9.20 from the Larson 9th edition textbook we see that one of three different things is going to be true when you're analyzing the convergence of these types of series. In one you're either going to converge possibly at the value at which you're centered, or in the case of two, there'll be a, oh, a slight interval of convergence around that value. Uh, that particular radius would be denoted here by this letter capital R. Or in number three's case, that particular series would converge for all values of x and thus would have an infinite sized interval of convergence. There's going to be a series of three examples in three different videos, uh, examples 2a, b, and c, that uh, you can look at. Uh, I'm going to take care of example 2a in this particular uh, video. And uh, not a lot to do here with, with 2a initially because uh, it, it perhaps might seem kind of obvious, perhaps, where this particular series converges. Um, if not, obviously we, we have the help of Theorem 920 to help us. Um, it becomes important uh, initially to identify what is the value of C that we spoke of earlier. Where is this particular series centered? And um, in this particular case, the answer is going to be zero because we don't see the uh, grouping symbols, the parentheses around this X term. That's usually your dead giveaway that it's going to be centered somewhere other than zero. So we've got our value of C being zero here. And what that really means is, well, okay, let's, let's take a look. If, if this x were 0, if we were truly centered there, the function f of 0 that's denoted by this series would take on the form, the summation from 0 to infinity, of n factorial times 0 to the n. And if we were to write out a few of the terms that comprise this series, starting with n equals 0, we would have 0 factorial times 0 to the first plus 1 factorial times 0 to the second plus 2 factorial. Uh, let's back up here. I think I need a 0 power there, sorry, on that first term. And let's give ourselves a first power on this second 0 term. Now we would have 2 factorial times 0 to the second. Turns out it's not going to make any difference, but I do, I do want to get these exponents correct. And then we get all the way to the end, and we would find that we would have an n factorial times 0 to the n. Now if you take a look at a lot of these terms, it's pretty apparent that, that all of these guys are, are just going to amount to nothing. You know, when, you look, when you see this 0 to the exponent of 1 or higher, you know that that's going to pretty much wipe out the term. All right, now this guy, all right, different story. 0 factorial times 0 to the 0. By definition, by definition, that is equal to 1. I know that might be a little hard to believe. Um, it's one of those things that I tell my students that you know, right now we're going to have to just accept. It's a little bit beyond the scope of the class, I think, to prove why this is the case. Uh, I would challenge any of you to grab a calculator and enter that particular expression into the calculator and it should know that the answer is indeed 1. So by this particular example I think I've made it pretty clear that this summation expression centered at 0 does indeed equal 1 and that is a finite value so we do know that we converge at the center like the theorem tells us. But what we're concerned now is about all of these other values of x. So let's try them out. Well, the other values of x that we're talking about would be anything outside of 0. And of course, a fancy way to write that would be the absolute value of x greater than 0, uh, which again just means x not equal to 0. So one way that I like to set these particular problems up is by doing a little bit of a substitution. It's a very common substitution that you'd use all throughout calculus. They call it a u substitution. And I'll let this other secondary function u 
sub n equal n factorial times x to the n. It's just sort of telling me that this is a function of the variable n. And if you think back to uh, some of the discussions that we've had in class, or if you've seen some of my other videos about determining the convergence of other types of, of series, we, we talked quite a bit about the various tests that can be run to determine convergence. And for a, a function such as this, there's one test that is really suited nicely in order to, to, to determine the convergence, and that would be the ratio test. Now, we recall, in the ratio test, what we're going to be concerned with doing is calculating a limit as n approaches infinity. And this particular limit that we calculate is going to be one of the absolute value of the u sub n plus 1 term divided by the u sub n term. Once again, if that's something that uh, is a little unfamiliar to you, by all means you could go and, and look at uh, any particular uh, webcast of the ratio test to bring yourselves up to speed. And in this particular example, we're going to go ahead and replace our u sub n plus 1 and our u sub n with the uh, particular function that we want. And in this case of u sub n plus 1, we replace n factorial by n plus 1 factorial, and the x to the n would become x to the n plus 1, multiplication between them, and then of course our u sub n is the original function. Now what's required is just to perform a little bit of algebra, some cancellation, and if we look at this carefully, we can notice really two things happening. First of all, as far as the n factorials are concerned, an n plus 1 factorial and an n factorial will cancel with each other. And they would leave simply an n plus 1 in the numerator. Now, if a student has difficult with that, difficulty with that, you could just really think of n factorial, of course, as just 1 times 2 times 3, et cetera, et cetera, all the way up to n, where n plus 1 factorial is much the same, except, of course, it consists of one more term thereafter. And we can see that you've got sort of a one-to-one -one cancellation going on with that particular uh, comparison, leaving with an n plus 1. And for the other portion of this, the x to the n plus 1 divided by n, you perhaps recall from Algebra 1 the uh, power rule where you are dividing like bases, you are allowed to subtract the exponents. So in this particular instance, we would have uh, n plus 1 left alongside an x to the first. Now, what I'm going to do with this, I'm going to rewrite this just a little bit differently. Um, the n plus 1 isn't really something that uh, is required to be inside the absolute values. And the reason being is you can tell that if n is going to be approaching infinity and, and the fact that it begins its countdown up here with n equals 0, we don't really run the risk of n plus 1 being negative. However, the x is a different story, so we're going to place n inside the absolute values. But as it turns out, it's not going to play a very big role in this problem either because as soon as you insert this infinite value for n, it, regardless of what value x takes on, it is going to be multiplied by something quite large, so large that we can actually call it infinity. So infinity times any value of x is going to yield infinity. Now, if you recall from uh, your ratio test experience, is if we do get an answer that is larger than 1, then that means that we are uh, dealing with a series that is divergent. And in this particular case, we're divergent for all of those values of x greater than 0, or the same thing as all values of x that were not equal to 0. 
So that doesn't mean that we don't converge anywhere because remember we've got to at least converge at uh, one value and that would have been the value at which we're centered. So to make a long story short, if you do get a value such as infinity or anything really bigger than one, then you can say that your series will only converge at its center. And that's exactly what's going on here. This series only converges at its value, we'll say x equals zero in this particular case. And in, in, in certain instances, you uh, might run across a situation where um, this particular problem, if we go back up to the directions, it did stay, say to, to find the radius of convergence. So in order to address that correctly, we'll go ahead and say that the capital R is equal to zero. That's not because we converge only at zero. That's because the distance from zero on either side for some type of an interval of convergence would be nothing. See you at the next lecture.